associate friends, and welcome to the World Transformed. My name is Phil Bowermaster, and with me in the virtual studio is my co-host, Stephen Gordon. Hello, Stephen. Hey, Phil. How are you? Well, I am super fantastic. How are you, my friend? Man, I'm doing great and uh, ready to uh, bring out some more podcasting goodness. Uh, how about you? Yeah, we got a we got a good one today. We're gonna focus on a very specific technology that we've talked about quite a bit over the past few years, but I always like to see a headline that calls this one out. We're going to talk about the replicator from Star Trek, specifically from Star Trek, but also just the idea of a machine that can make anything. We're going to use the word replicator to reference that idea, that idea of the universal assembler, the machine that can that can make anything. And we saw this headline, a real world Star Trek replicator is now possible thanks to new breakthrough. Now, I would get super excited when I saw a headline like this if we didn't see it every, what, a year and a half or so, right? It seems like... Uh... <laughs> Wait, and you know that the guys that are behind this technology, you know, when they read that, they want to roll their eyes so far back in their head, you know, that <laughs> they, typically uh, the, the, uh, the scientists behind the breakthroughs tend to get a little queasy with the reporting of their breakthroughs when it, when with, with things like that. But it, I, I can see why the reporter put it that way, though, because this is pretty, pretty great stuff here. This is pretty impressive. I think it's there's a there's a continuum. There's an evolution that we're tracking of technologies from very basic 3D printing through nanotechnology to eventually having something that would be a universal assembler. Eventually it would be the, I think my comment on this story in on Facebook was, okay, it's not quite T Earl Grey hot yet, right? We're not really there yet, uh, which is which is what the, uh, Captain Picard always said to the replicator in Star Trek. And he could just, you know, magically have his cup of tea and the cup and the tea would, would magically appear. How close is this to that? Well, according to the story, a startup with alumni from MIT and Yale say it's made a breakthrough in creating a next generation material that should make it possible to 3D print literally anything out of thin air. Now, right off, I think, are they overselling in the headline, in the lead sentence there? Uh, probably. Uh, out of thin air is, uh, um, yeah, you know, you can't get out of air every type of, you know, atom that you might need to assemble any molecule you might want. Uh, but, you know, it's... Uh, they're, if they're exaggerating, maybe not by too much, based on what we read in the rest of the article. So, right. Uh, I mean, the, the out of thin air, once again, comes from taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. And we talked about this well, last week when we talked about food from thin air. And that really was food from thin air. So that was, that was good. And you're right, because what they're doing here is they're getting large-scale carbon nanotubes out of CO2 that they're taking right from the, right from the air. Now, large-scale carbon nanotubes are a tremendously versatile material with incredible potential for things you can make. And I think that, right. you know, when you picture a typical 3D printer from the last few years, or even maybe a cutting edge one from today, what you have in your mind is a machine that is making some very sophisticated layers of plastic, right? <laughs> and it's able to, you know, shape some really interesting, really interesting objects. This is well beyond that. This is well beyond that because these are these are structures that not only can you make just about anything out of. So so start thinking in terms of objects that would be made of metal or that would be made of the kinds of composite materials that you could make furniture or your car or your home out of or something like that. So you really do open up this whole new world of capability in terms of what you make. Also, and they're talking here about We'll be able to produce zero carbon, a carbon zero gasoline, diesel, and jet fuels that are cheaper than fossil fuels. So they're they're really talking about expanding what we think of the capability of a three D printer being. I mean, it really is a it really is a whole new world there. It's still not make anything. You know, I don't think you can you can make food. Right? You can't make a cup of tea out of it, and it's it's still what you can do with carbon. But it turns out you can do an awful lot with carbon, doesn't it? I guess you can. And the reason it's carbon zero um, for our audience, Phil, is uh, because if you're pulling the carbon out of the atmosphere, yeah, the, the gasoline that it makes releases just as much carbon as the gasoline that you presently have in your gas tank. But since you got the carbon out of the atmosphere to begin with, you're just putting it back in the atmosphere, and so you are net zero, right? And 
they're saying that although this has been done in other ways, where uh, where you're pulling carbon out of the atmosphere to make gasoline, diesel, and jet fuel, their their method is much more cost effective, and therefore could be brought to market easier than other methods. Is is way they're the way they're selling that. But so that's uh, that's pretty cool, Phil. It's an interesting take on what you do with this technology because it combines those two ideas, doesn't it? We, we did a show, I don't know, a year ago, maybe a little more than a year ago. It was cold. It was called, I think, gold from thin air, right? And we, we were talking about this idea of making fuel from CO2, actually, you know, just, just pulling, this, pulling the CO2 out of the atmosphere and making fuel out of it. And it was a different process for doing this that some folks had come up with and they were, they were talking about implementing this idea. But that is a great way to kind of pay for improving carbon nanotube technology, right? They've, they've uh, leapfrogging, let's say, carbon nanotube technology, actually getting that whole infrastructure off the ground. If, if there's a way to immediately turn it into cash, right? And one way to do that is to sell the carbon nanotubes because there's a lot of commercial and industrial applications for them. And if you've got a machine that can, that can produce them in different shapes, you're, you're, you're part of the way there too. But you add to that this idea of, oh, we can also pull the CO2 out of the atmosphere and we can make fuel. We can sell you gasoline. We can sell you jet fuel. That's carbon neutral. That starts to sound like a pretty good business model. I don't know. They've got me halfway interested in investing. I don't know about you, Stephen, but I mean. <laughs> That's probably an early thing that they do with this technology. Uh, they're talking about that first. Okay, we, we we're, the low-hanging fruit is the uh, carbon-neutral gasoline, but uh, sky's the limit after that. You know, whenever somebody starts talking about large-scale production of carbon nanotubes, I always fall back to, okay, uh, when, when can I have my space elevator then? Right, <laughs> right. So that's, that's probably, you know, on down the road, uh, far past the carbon-neutral, uh, carbon-zero gasoline. So let, let's watch this space, Bill. Let's keep up with it. Well, absolutely. And the related story here is chemists make first-ever ring of pure carbon. And this is really interesting just because – the carbon nanotube is one structure, one thing you can do with, with carbon that opens up whole new worlds of possibility for manufacturing. And now this is kind of a long sought after structure, a ring, a circle of 18 carbon atoms. And they worked from a triangular uh, mo molecule of carbon and oxygen, and they manipulated it with electric currents. And lo and behold, they've been able to create this carbon ring. One thing Check out the picture. It's beautiful, right? It's a very cool looking structure. But probably more important, you know, we've talked about we've talked about the progression from just working with working with carbon in its more simple forms to buckyballs to carbon nanotubes to now the carbon ring. What kinds of possibilities is this going to open up? What are people going to be able to do with these uh, cyclocarbons that they haven't been able to do? up to this point, I, I would say to be determined, right? You know, stay tuned. But it's, it's just, it's another interesting step in that direction. And if you check the history of carbon in our lives, it's, there's a paradox there. Let's, let's, let's call it a paradox about alarm over CO2 in the atmosphere. So we think of carbon as the bad guy, but really carbon has become this incredibly useful substance in our lives. I was thinking about this the other day because I had to buy my son a new baseball bat right? He had this really good aluminum bat, much better than anything I ever owned when I was a kid. And the coach tells me, you know what, that's a little heavy <laughs> because now everybody's getting these carbon composite bats, right? I bought a, I got a, you know, I got a new bike a while back and it was, and it's made in a carbon composite. And now it's heavy compared to the ones that a few years later people are buying, right? Suddenly our world, you know, sporting equipment, but it, it's, it's showing up in, it's showing up in our vehicles. It's showing up in our furniture. It's all over our electronics more and more things are being made out of it. And that is before we're upstream from carbon nanotubes really being involved, right? We're upstream right, from right. anything like this, uh, like this ring of carbon. I think what we're, what we're in here is we're in the very early stages of a big shift to most stuff being made from that. And it, you know, it won't, it will not happen overnight. Although I think it is kind of sneaking up on us. I think we are seeing more and more things in our lives made out of that. And it's, it's one of the reasons that it's probably a good idea to get off coal as a fuel, right? It's because we're going to need that coal, right, to build our world out, <laughs> basically. Um, there, we'll quickly find there's not nearly enough CO2 in the atmosphere to do everything that we want to do with it uh, in, in terms of just the, just the utility of carbon for, for building things out of. And when everybody's got one of these CO2, well, not CO2, these 
carbon nanotube 3D printers in their homes. Uh, I don't know. It's going to be a very interesting time, very carbon-based uh, society. Although we'll keep sucking as much CO2 out of the atmosphere as we can, I suppose, to, to ward off climate change. This might be the ultimate solution to that, too. <laughs> we, we, we 20th century people, uh, Phil, can just like, you know kick back and tell them, you're welcome for the carbon in the atmosphere. That's right. We did, we did what we could to make it easy to get the ball rolling on this thing. Yeah, I, I don't know if any, anybody's going to be grateful, Stephen. I really don't. Uh, maybe, maybe not. But, uh, <laughs> you know, when the inevitable graduate reboot happens, Phil, so they're not going to, you know, they won't tell the young man, you know, plastics. They'll say carbon manipulation. You know, That's right. Your, your, future, your future is manipulating carbon in one way or another. So. That's right. Yeah, right, now, was, right now it would be, I got one word for you, son, nanotubes, right? In a couple of years. Yeah. One word for you, son, cyclocarbon. Or one, one word for you, young lady, cyclocarbon, right? It's all, it's all happening. So anyway, this is, this, is a, this is a quick check-in. I don't want to oversell the carbon future, but I think, the, I think the tendency is and the risk is that we don't see this happening. Um, when we talked, oh, oh gosh, it's been a few years ago now, when Eric Drexler had a new book out on nanotechnology, one of the things he mentioned in that book was that this whole revolution in nanotechnology is kind of quietly occurring in other industries. And he talked about material science and he talked about chemistry and things they were doing with folding proteins and you know all this stuff eventually converges and you get something very similar to what he described in his original book, Engines of Creation. And I think one of the primary areas, one of the, one of the pillars that's holding up this progress, excuse me, that's, that's making this progress possible, one of the things that's really enabling this progress is incredible work that's happening around carbon nanotubes and just material science making making stuff out of carbon. I don't know. We're living in a we're we're, we're living in a carbon world. And if that if, if that gets us closer to T Earl Grey hot, great. But I still think to swing it back to the original point, we, we still got a ways to go there. Other things have to be other things have to be brought into that before we're quite to the not to not to give the headline guy too hard of a time, but quite a ways to go before we're quite to this real world Star Trek replica. Hey, he got us to click on it. So, you know, there you are. He got uh, us to do a show on it. Well, think about it. So. <laughs> we put it out there, even though we were disagreeing. Maybe, maybe they're smarter than we were giving them credit for. Well, there it is. Okay, so that's our update on nanotechnologies and replicators. We're going to be back next time. We're going to talk a little bit about another technology that kind of leaps out of science fiction and into the real world. We're going to talk about terraforming Mars. Okay, so that's going to be fun. Look forward to having that conversation. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you all for being with us. And until next time, live to see it.